and 11 is 26 and R is 30 so that's actually only 4 uh, mm -hmm. and here I have whatever I have 15 and 4 is um, 15 and 9 rather is 24 uh, so S overall is 44 so that makes this 20 uh, and finally uh, this is 27 but C is only 28 so there's only one person here okay uh, this is the poor person who had good resumes and bad clothing. No, I guess, how many people had, uh, had, no, this, this, these are the people you should be really angry about. They had good resumes and good salaries, eight of them, Woo! but bad clothing, and so they were not offered interviews. Um, well, great. Uh, final question, uh, was something like, um, oh wait, hold on, how many students were offered interviews, answer seven, how many students passed the resume screen but failed the other two? Um, so this was, this was actually just part A of this problem, uh, was, was, was trying to, to find the, the number of people who, who made, who were offered interviews. Part B said, um, uh, f how many students passed the resume screening but failed the other two um, so that they weren't in S and they weren't in C but they were in R. So I guess that's four? Wait. Uh, oh my god. <laughs> passed the resume screen but failed the other two. Yeah, so if you failed the other two, it means you did not have a good salary, and you do not have good clothing, um, but you uh, did uh, have a, a good resume, so that's four people. Um, all right, so good. Uh, that was uh, done extremely slowly and methodically and thoroughly. I hope this is uh, an explanation of the of the inclusion exclusion principle. I will now. Uh, and you could argue that this is just not even necessary. I will now prove the inclusion-exclusion principle. So if you want to turn off the video right now, that's a um, very reasonable thing to do. Uh, because I think your understanding is going to be fine. And I think I only have done this proof. Actually, I, I plan to do it every year, but I ran out of time and I, I, I it's possible I've never done this proof. Uh, maybe one time I actually did this this. Um, because um, I'm not sure if the proof adds that much to the understanding because it's just the, the proof of the general case. But on the other hand, maybe it will add to your understanding. Let's find out. Um, and having not really done this proof very often, um, we'll see how fluid my explanation is. Uh, first, some, some background, or at least uh, for me, uh, this is background that I think is needed. Now this year we did have this conversation in class, so uh, this hopefully will be uh, familiar. If you missed it, well, here it is again. Um, there was this problem, which I found to be extremely hard and uh, confusing uh, until it was explained to me, and then it's trivial, which is um, given, some, given some set uh, of size n, uh, so given some set which is of size n, so it's finite, uh, show that there are, so this is just, a theorem, I guess, um, or I'll just say claim, uh, claim uh, if uh, the size of some set is n, then there are the same number, there are the same uh, number of even sized uh, and odd sized subsets. of S. Okay, um, well, uh, yeah, so what is, so, so how do you, how do you do this, or, or how do you prove that this is true? Um, the explanation which I think is simplest, which we did in class, so I, I'll kind of say it quickly, is that the, the number of even-sized subsets, I think this was got this notation from earlier in the chapter, uh, is in fact just uh, 2 to the n minus 1. And why is this? Well, okay, so first of all, this is obviously the answer because um, 
how many um, subsets are there? Well, if S has size n, it means that S is a set with n objects in it, uh, or n elements. And how many subsets? Well, a subset is just a collection of some of those objects. And so it becomes a, a counting problem that for each object, it could be either in the set or out of the set. And so you have two choices uh, for each object of whether to include it or exclude it. And therefore, uh, the, the size of the, the power set, the set of all subsets, is definitely just like 2 to the n. Uh, and that was a kind of a combinatorial, combinatorial argument that uh, for, for any element, including it or excluding it, it's two choices. Uh, and uh, that's true for each of the n elements. So the counting, fundamental counting principle says you, you multiply them. So you multiply by two n times. Uh, and uh, also, just duh, half of them are going to be odd and half of them are going to be even. Okay, why uh, is that true? Well, we said that, um, what we said is, um, Go through your, your, your objects one at a time, put, the, put, the, put your objects in some kind of order, and then uh, go through them one at a time, uh, deciding whether to include them or exclude them from a certain set. So if you have, so think of your n objects as all lined up, and well, for your first object, um, uh, you have two choices about whether to include it or exclude it. In the second object, you have two choices. In the third object, you have two choices, etc. Uh, until you get to the second to last object, you still have two choices. But then, um, if we are determined to make a set with an even number of elements, um, then we don't have a choice uh, as to whether to include the, the last element or not, because the choice is determined. If I have already picked precise, if I already have selected an even number of objects, then if my subset has to be even sized, then I cannot um, uh, pick the, the, the nth element uh, to put in the subset. And uh, conversely, if I've picked an even number of elements, uh, an odd number of elements so far, then I must include the nth element in my subset for, to make that subset even. And so the number of possible subsets which are even is, uh, uh, is just uh, the product of the two choices I have for every single element up to the last one, so that's 2 to the n minus 1. And for the exact same reason, uh, this is also 2 to the n minus 1, and that's a kind of a, a combinatorial proof uh, of that fact. Okay. Uh, we did all this in class, and I think we even did the follow-up. So this is one way of thinking about it. The follow-up is, uh, is to claim then that we have proved as a theorem uh, that, uh, that the sum uh, from uh, r equals 0 to n of negative 1 to the um, r uh, and let me let me use k's because r's are and n's look a lot alike. So cha 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 and the cha cha cha. Um, oh, is uh, is zero? This is a this is a, a claim that you often see. That um, basically, if you go to a certain the way you should think about this is if you go to a certain row of Pascal's triangle. And you, um, this is kind of a Pascal's triangle based explanation of this. You go to a certain row of Pascal's triangle and you um, uh, alternately add and subtract along that row, it's always going to be zero. Uh, we did this in class, we just do it again really quick. So, one, four, six, four, one. So, let's take an uh, odd uh, sized uh, row uh, or an odd length row, which is to say um, the, the, the fourth row. Uh, and uh, here it's sort of less obvious when there are an even number of mm, entries in the row, it's more clear that it's symmetric, and so if you add, subtract, add, subtract, uh, then it's sort of clear that it's going to be zero, but here it's, it's less clear. And uh, yeah, you just see, right? One minus four is, um, yeah. Uh, one minus four is negative three, and six is three, and um, subtracting four, negative one and one is zero. So that's kind of uh, fascinating, and uh, how can you explain this uh, theorem? Well, you should just uh, think of this theorem as, as saying, uh, in so sort of just rewriting it without the, the sigma notation, that this is just um, uh, n choose zero, uh, and yeah, minus, n choose 1 plus n choose 2 uh, minus n choose 3, etc. And you just sort of go all the way out. Oh, okay, so uh, plus dot dot dot. And then what do we do? We get When we get to the kth one, 
it's negative 1 to the k, n choose k. Is it negative 1 or? Yeah, yeah, of course. Uh, and then the final one is, well, it's going to be n choose, k, uh, n choose n, and I will just, uh, there's this notation that sometimes people use of, uh, uh, of just, well, I'll just write plus minus because it depends on whether n itself is even or odd. Um, whether that last one is being is being added or subtracted. Well, uh, this writing that without the sigma notation doesn't necessarily make it any more clear. But based on what we just did above, um, then uh, we see that these can be rearranged. I now think combinatorially uh, of n choose zero as being the number of zero sized subsets of n, and n choose two as being the number of two-sized subsets of n, and n choose four as being the number of uh, four-sized subsets of n. And if you do all this, then you realize that because of the, the uh, alternating sign, uh, these are all being uh, added. So I'll just leave it as that. Uh, and then we are subtracting um, n choose one and uh, n choose three uh, and uh, and choose uh, five, etc. And so dot dot dot. And this is zero. Is the is the claim? Uh, and that claim is just true by the combinatorial argument we gave above, because this is just the, uh, the this first thing here in brackets is all the even size subsets, and the second thing here in brackets is all the odd size subsets, and they're the same number of even size subsets and odd size subsets. Okay. So now this theorem has been proved. Uh, the, the sort of uh, cheaty way to, to do this problem, uh, I'll just squeeze it in right here, it's, it's a cheat because it just provides no actual understanding, uh, is to just apply the binomial theorem to, um, to uh, uh, how, do we, how do I write, yeah, one plus, you know, negative one to the n. And if we're just very confident in the binomial theorem algebraically as applying equally well to negatives, uh, of course, you know, that's just zero. Uh, and now you just say, okay, well, what does the binomial theorem say here? It says uh, n choose uh, zero times, um, you know, one to the n. Okay, but then here you just, okay, these are all just ones or negative ones. So, so now you're going to, okay, can I just stop? I think I should stop. Plus n choose two, uh, minus n choose three, etc. Uh, okay, so uh, da, 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 and then again, I'll just write plus minus uh, n choose n. Okay, so whether you think of this as a, a trivial application of the binomial theorem to one plus negative one, or if you think of the binomial theorem as being true for for combinatorial reasons, then you don't have access to this uh, these manipulations with negative quantities. Uh, so you should uh, translate this statement with positives and negatives into a, into a combinatorial statement, which really says, actually, the, 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 the combinatorial thing to do is to really uh, translate this statement into, into this statement, that saying that this is zero is really like saying that these two are equal, and that we've proven combinatorially. Okay, that was a 15-minute uh, ramble of a review of something we did three or four weeks ago. Finally! We shall prove the inclusion-exclusion principle. Let's go. Everything all right? Hold on. Okay. Um, so, see what kind of time we got going here. Yeah. Uh, let me pause this for a second and come right back.